Did you know we're running a convention? That's right. The Nerd and Tie Expo is taking place September 23rd through 25th, 2016 in Eau Claire, Wisconsin at the Plaza Hotel and Suites. You can pre-register right now for only $30. $30, that's 10 bucks off the at-the-door price. It's pretty cheap and pretty great and pretty amazing. Pre-registration's only open for a few more weeks here, so you should get it in while you can. This episode of Nerd and Tie is also brought to us by listeners like you who are help supporting us through our GoFundMe campaign. If you want to pitch in and help us, go to GoFundMe.com slash Nerd and Tie and throw a few dollars our way for our legal fund. We need your help and want to thank everyone who's tried to help us so far. On this Fortnite's episode of Nerd and Time, Matt Ryan is reprising as well as Constantine in an animated Justice League dark film. The Rocketeer is getting a sequel reboot, and Steve Cardenas calls out Texas Comic Con organizers. All that, and the mailbag is absolutely bursting at the seams, and we're going to get to it this episode. On this Fortnite's episode of Nerd and Time. Audio only, man. Yeah, we're only, you can't see us, which is good because I don't have any clothes today. Um, So I am sitting here completely in the buff at my, my roommate is not a fan of it, but I don't have anything to wear. Um, Coming to you. That's horrifying. (laughs) Coming to you in this way, and in the way that he entered the world, I'm one of your hosts, Professor (laughs) Firsters. With me as always, possibly clothed as Trey Dorn. I am wearing pants. I insist that I am wearing pants. And looking pretty kicking in those jeans, it's Nick Izumi. I'm actually not wearing jeans for once. So your like pants ever? Thing, Nick. No, I have pants, just oh. not jeans. That's disappointing. Oh, so... <laughs> this is a Should weird, be disappointing. A weird night. Like, okay, so we, like, I, I myself, I'm going to apologize to all of our listeners. We. Uh, we've been all over the place for recording in the last couple, the last few episodes. This is now 6.13 p.m. on a Wednesday night um, <laughs> is what we're recording at right now. So apologies to everybody who is like, hey, I, I want to listen to my podcast on Wednesday. It, 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 it'll happen. You'll get it. You're just getting it. We're so sorry. It, it happens. Like it's... between people being uh-huh. sick and like having stuff going on. We finally got to it tonight, and we've had com- and I've had computer issues producing the video version these last few episodes. If you hadn't noticed, so that's why we we are abandoned. Like we could have delayed another day and maybe gone video, but we'll just go audio only because most of you only listen to the audio version, anyways. And frankly, I don't blame you. And frankly, you know we're not much to look at. No, not me. A, I need yeah, a haircut. Really a... I need a haircut pretty badly. Yeah, I I am not attractive right now. So that that and we've just all like I, I'm a mess because I, I've been spending all my free time just playing Pokemon Go. It's also really hot out and we're all sweaty and gr- anyway. I'd say it's terrible. Right so now. so so the People secret is terrible. is that originally we were going to record on Monday night, but I kind of almost gave myself heat stroke playing Pokemon Go. What? You're <laughs> supposed to drink oh, my God. Today. Come on. I almost uh, physically collapsed. Valor attaboy. I took uh. the gym. <laughs> so. But we got we got drink a water. I I drink a lot of water. I'm I'm only level twenty three, man. Gotta get higher. Gotta get we higher. Yeah, we don't have a lot of news on this Fortnite's episode. However, we do Fortnite and a quarter, but we do have a, a lot of mail. So we're gonna we're gonna get to that eventually here at the end of the episode, as we always do. But uh, we got a lot. Except for last of- episode where we didn't get to the mail, and that's why we have a lot of mail this episode. We just let it sit there yes, like we my did. mailbox, and I empty it once a month. Uh, <laughs> mostly bills. Um, but uh, we, we have a couple of news stories to talk about. One that's really exciting, and we're all really happy about. Um, so Matt Ryan, uh, I think at this point in his career, um, has pretty much cemented himself as Constantine. <laughs> uh, uh, or Constantine, however you want to do it. Uh, that, that's, how, uh, that's how Alan Moore says it. Constantine, all right. Uh, that's not somebody. how anyone says it anywhere else. That's, a, that's, how, that's not how anyone else says it, but that's how the creator says it. So I'd rather not say anything that Alan Moore says. Uh, but, uh, hey, but, Alan uh, Moore at least uh, agrees that the killing joke is awful. Good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, 
But anyway, so Matt Ryan uh, pretty much has uh, cemented himself in the role of Constantine forever based on both the TV show and his appearance uh, as Constantine in the uh, the Arrow season three episode. Four. Four. Season four episode. Uh, so he, he likes playing the role. It's something that he loves. And he gets to reprise it one more time. Uh, as it was recently announced that he will be reprising the role of Constantine in the animated Justice League Dark film uh, coming out very, very soon. Woo-hoo. This fall. I, I like it. I mean, I don't know. He, When you have a person that loves playing a character as much as someone like Matt Ryan likes playing Constantine, I think you might as well. <laughs> uh, they're obviously, they're obviously going to give everything they've got to this role, and, and why wouldn't you just give it to somebody that's going to say, like, yeah, I know the character, I know what it should sound like, and all that stuff, and it's somebody that people are familiar with. As well, well. It, it also just kind of cemented it for me with him as Constantine. The instant I saw him in the live-action series when he like, mm-hmm. looked like he walked off the comic book page. It's he just looks like Constantine, so of course that's what Constantine. We're not getting that element in this movie, though. Right? But, no, uh, but but that means though is that that's what my brain now expects his voice to sound like. The I'm really excited for this movie. Like, uh, in addition to Matt Ryan uh, reprising Constantine, which is amazing, um, just the lineup that they have for this Justice League Dark Team is really my dream. Uh, dark team lineup you've got etrigan the demon you've got zatanna you've got dead man you've got swamp thing and everyone knows how much i love swamp thing (laughs) um the only thing i'm not that jazzed about is that uh the little promo video that dc put out um implied that jason o'mara's batman is going to be our audience cipher character and it just goes to more of my argument of, damn it, DC, can you just do something without Batman just, just yeah. once? <laughs> but it is Jason O'Mara. J- and, and, and don't get me wrong, Jason he's O'Mara fertile. has gotten really, he's really good at it. Like, the first movie he did with the animated group, Justice League War, he was not that great. Since then, he has been getting more and more into the character. He's better with each movie. <laughs> And, and he's the just, star of several one-season-long canceled science fiction series. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he's he, Fergal he, on Monarch of the Glen. And he's joining <laughs> Agents wolf. of S.H.I.E.L.D. just in time for that to get canceled. Too. I, know, I mean, right? uh, Are they going to get to syndication like this season? Uh, syndicate? I think so. That's four. Yeah, right? Four I, thought it was five. That's... I thought it was five seasons. Well, no, it's an episode. Oof. It's a number of episodes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I th- yeah it's it's... They should be pretty close to syndication number, I think. Yeah, like, because, yeah, there's some shows, like, yeah. Anyway. Shows off. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, the movie looks pretty good. The animation is has been consistently good from the DC animated studios. <laughs> which, as long as it's not, you know, we're going to let the killing joke be an outlier. You know, um, I, I, just, I just keep pretending that that's not happening. Like... I'm to, to put this in perspective. I'm a really hardcore fan of these straight-to-video animated ones. Like normally, I go into my Best Buy. I get like the ultra limited edition that comes with the comic book and the little figurine. And then with Killing Joke, I just I didn't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting any edition because I don't want that to be a thing ever. Well, you know, to be fair, the animation might be fine. And can you really consider uh, it straight don't worry, to? it's not. Can you consider it straight to video since it did get a theatrical release? I guess that's true. It had so a limited can... theatrical run. Yeah, it did have its limited theatrical. That's over, I believe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, only it was only two like, days. It was like it was two days. It was yeah. a two-day thing, so you could like see uh, Bruce Wayne uh, have sex with Barbara Gordon on a big screen if you that's wanted to. So wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So many reasons that I'm not going to watch that movie. That's one of the big ones. Yeah. On a rooftop. Uh, <laughs> what is she, Catwoman? Uh, Bruce Tim. Uh, like, I, we, every time we talk about DC animation, we always praise Paul Dini and Bruce Tim. But someone needs to tell Bruce Tim that no one wants that pairing and he needs to stop bringing it up. Yeah, that's, it's a gross pairing. Because this isn't the first time the only, he's done The only thing that. Bruce Tim has really done well is design characters. Mm-hmm. I don't really care about him as a storyteller. 
but he, he does neat drawings. But, you know, honestly, though, sometimes his drawings that he does just on his own look a little, like, make a little creepy. So, like, when he, he did just... draw Hakaider, though. When he draws, like, female characters, sometimes... Yeah, he's can, a little weird. Like, it's fine on the shows where it was toned down, obviously, by different editorial control, but... So, it's like, I feel like um, Bruce Tim, while I love his distinctive style... We we got to give more credit to yeah. the Dini and less to the Tim, right? And I think I think it's also you know important to remember that just because someone can do one thing well doesn't mean that everything that they do is great. Yes, you this know, is very true. We have to remember that these creators were fans of our human, and not elevate them beyond like, you know, to to some higher level because even the the best creators will do bad things. Like, uh, mm-hmm. like even Gail, some, you know, Gail Simone. I will, you know, I love Gail Simone. It's right. She's a phenomenal writer, but even she and some of her earlier stuff had some problematic, you know, stuff that she then self-corrected in later work. And ha- you know, she's very public about admitting her mistakes and about how she mm-hmm. could have done certain things better. Um, but that, so that's why it's like just because someone's name is on it doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect because we can't hold these human beings to perfect standards. Or else they're always going to fail. Indeed. Indeed. That's it's fair. But so yeah, Matt Ryan playing Constantine again. Yeah. I'm, I'm so jazzed. I'm looking forward to getting this one. I just I just hope that we like would anybody. I mean, it's not going to happen. But I just want Constantine after Constantine movie with him in it, like animated, something, I'm, anything. I'm just Give him sad that as much like, time with the character as possible. I'm just sad that, like, uh, we haven't heard DC... Like, this is the only Justice League Dark thing we've heard DC wanting to move forward on. Like, I would love it if they did a D- Justice League Dark live-action movie with him in it, quite frankly. Yeah, you know, I feel like, okay, so it's easy to do a separate continuity with him playing the character again in animated form. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it might confuse audiences to see him play... Like, any Justice yeah, League... any Any live-action appearances by him have to take place in a consistent reality. That's true. So, you know, it's... Yeah. Those listeners at home who don't know, yeah, the animated movies aren't set in the Arrowverse. They're set in their own distinct little timeline that um, starts either with Flashpoint Paradox or Justice Mm -hmm. League War, depending on how you look at it. But uh, save for Son of Batman, they've all been pretty good movies. Yeah, that movie sucks. I haven't watched uh, yes. any of these. Um, <laughs> there were, the, honestly, like I said, uh, Justice League War is not great, but it's okay. Um, uh, Batman versus Robin is cool. Um, Throne of Atlantis is cool. Um, Batman Bad Blood has Dick Grayson Batman equals one of my favorite things ever. The Teen Does Titans the one they Swift did recently was good. Soundtrack? What? Which one? Bad blood? No, no, there's not. Damn it! But it, but it does have Batwoman's first animated appearance, dude. Like, and she's awesome. And they, uh, speaking of playing things right, they kept in the whole plot point that she's a lesbian, and they don't like make a big like thing out of it or make it awkward. They just make it. They just establish that she's a really great character. And then have that as something that informs her character, not it, it's not her entire persona. So, yeah, really freaking well done. Also, she gets a hit on Renee Montoya, and it's really cute. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's really good. Um, but yeah, no, the uh, the animated movies have been pretty consistently solid. We'll just not look at Killing Joke. I'm really excited to get Matt Ryan back, and I'm really excited to see him interact with Swamp Thing. Because <laughs> goddamn Swamp Thing. All right. Hey, speaking of uh, bringing back classic characters who um, are beloved by some <laughs> people, um, so uh, there is talk going around that uh, a 90s cult film classic, The Rocketeer, 
might be getting some sort of sequel or reboot in the near future. Nice! Yeah, I love The Rocketeer. Um, some people might remember it, uh, directed by Joe Johnston, who did October Sky and Captain America, the first Avenger. Um, it's a really fun little movie. Not nearly enough people love it as much as I think they should. It's, and, it's uh, such a good, like, pulp movie. I love it. It's... Yeah, it, it's really fun. It's, it's got that ooh, ah, gee whiz, 1940s sci-fi feel, and I absolutely adore it. And Nazi punching. Don't forget Nazi punching. Well, that's part of the ooh, ah, gee whiz. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it looks like they want to do a remake, possibly with a uh, with a uh, black woman as the main protagonist, the yeah, titular it's... Rocketeer, yeah, it's... which is a really good idea. Yeah, it, it, they're, they're, it would be more referred to as a reboot because it actually would also be a sequel. So it's not a remake because they're not rem- – they actually would be in continuity with the earlier Rocketeer film. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. so that's that's the idea. They want to make uh, – the, the, and they would call it the Rocketeers is the current development title where it would be a team right. led by the this um, yet-to-be-named or cast – African American woman lead character. Yeah. It's and, if they and, said it like if they actually said it like in um like just like a few years afterward, like after the first one, you could actually do some really cool stuff with the uh civil rights movement if they Well if they you, you mean you mean if they said it the like the same because I think the first movie takes place in the nineteen thirties. So, yeah, I guess so. So maybe if you so no, but not the, immediately after. But that makes sense, right? Though, because uh, yeah, the nineteen twenties, you know, not nineteen twenty, nineteen early nineteen nineties, which is what I meant to say, uh, is when the original was made, and it's been, um, you know, over twenty years. So setting the sequel, approximately, you know, t- over just over t- you know twenty five years later, is the perfect timing to put you smack dab in the middle of the civil rights movement. So, Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's, that could be a really solid way to do it. And uh, I just want more rocketeer. I'm going to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's one, it's one of those movies that I didn't see in theaters when I was a kid. Um, I am old enough to have seen it in theaters because, you know, it would have been, I don't remember what year that movie came out, but you know, I was, I was born in 1980. So, you know, I would have been at least the age demographic for the film when it came out. But I watched it on cable, like, several times. And, yeah, it's because that's back when, you know, if you wanted to watch a movie, you had to wait till it, like, aired on, like, TNT at 3 in the afternoon on Sunday. Unless you felt like running out to Blockbuster for it. Um, God. You know, as opposed <laughs> to now, where, like, we have half the film back catalog available on some streaming service. You can somewhere. find just about every movie somewhere online. And the ones you can't, you can just find through the not legal methods. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it's like still, you know, it, it's a different world, folks. A different world. Uh, but yeah, no, I love the rocket. What I love about the Rocketeer is just. It's such a fun movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's. It's a fun movie. It's also, it, I mean, it's heavily influenced by a lot of those Republic serials, and which you know, I'm I'm blanking on some of the names of them, but like, uh, like so, the Republic serials had like this one jetpack prop that they used in like, like the Republic series of like the 40s and 50s and 60s, like had one jetpack prop that they used for everything, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like you seriously like. Because it's the same stock footage of the main character, like, taking off with a mask on, like, you have to, like, watch for more than, if you ever see one, like, you have to watch for more than 10 minutes to figure out which serial you're watching. Like, oh, no, oh, this is obviously the stratosphere. Okay, that one. Okay. Early, early MST3K kept running bits of those, I remember. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, there was a Bella Lugosi one, and I just watched that one the other well, night, actually. I, I happen to love Zombies of the Stratosphere because a young Leonard Nimoy is in it as one of the bad guys. Oh, my God. I really so. liked uh, Creepers. Creepers was good. Or the cre- like Creeps. I don't remember, but it was something. It was Bella Lugosi hosted it and was part of it. Yeah. it's uh, So, anyways, like, I love that, like, the whole, the Rocketeer, I mean, like, it was, like, the original comic was a throwback to that stuff, and then the film kind of took that and brought it up to a new level, but I love that aesthetic, um, 
of the the jet age design and so getting that, more of that <clears throat> that movie was the reason was uh, like when i heard that the director of that movie was doing captain america the first avenger all of my concerns about the first captain america movie went away yeah like that's how jazzed i was oh man maybe they'll get joe johnson back <laughs> anything is possible or the, or the russo brothers they'll they'll peel away from marvel for a little bit to do rocketeers well it's owned <laughs> by disney isn't it Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's mistaken. the same parent company. It doesn't really matter. Like you can shuffle people around within that company. Yeah, I didn't oh know how busy they yeah. are. Probably getting ready for Infinity Wars coming up. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be insane. Yeah, I do not envy having to write a script with that many characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, it's like as as that keeps drawing closer and closer. I'm I'm just like. Well, you know, so here's the thing with the Infinity War stuff is that that's been kind of the end cap on the Marvel stuff for a while in their announcements. And, you know, like the the films coming after it have been, you know, pretty sparse in announcing that after the second Infinity, like the second Infinity War movie, which I guess is no longer called Infinity War Part 2, and they're going to give it a different title. Um, Infiniter. <laughs> Infinity War. Infinity Harder. Yeah. And like, but with the, the, they came up with this massive plan and they're going to run out of plan. So we're going to see what happens. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Nothing but Republic serials in film form. Make it happen. <laughs> there are a lot of 1940s Marvel characters you can do that with. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's. I mean, last episode we talked about Brie Larson getting cast as Captain Marvel. I think there's there's a whole bunch of characters they can explore I down the ticket. I want and... them to fight Swarm at one point. That's what what I love I mean. is that multiple actresses have come out and said they want to play Squirrel Girl. That's right? and, hilarious and awesome. And it's, uh oh, who was it? that? Well, Anna Kendrick yeah. is the most notable one, but there was another actress who said she wanted to play Squirrel Girl also. The, she was from Stranger Things, yeah. Yeah, so... But you know that's not even like a, a, a that's not even conceptually a film project that they're looking to do. Yet, like, she's people... gonna show up in the Defenders. We've we've already said this. She's gonna be showing up in the Defenders. Like that's gonna happen. I, I don't think Doreen Green is gonna show up in the Defenders. I, I think that is I the least likely does. venue to see Doreen Green. I think Cut. in literally on, you're, Midwest you're, Avengers. They're not going to insert the the Silver Age homage character in the middle of the grittiest, most realistic part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm about well, to say, yeah, the the, the most unpleasant corner of the entire Marvel Universe, right there. Like, there's plenty of room for happy, cheerful stuff, whether it be Guardians of the Galaxy, the Thor films, like. There's 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 jokes, there's humor, you know, of varying degrees, like, you know, but literally like the Defenders corner of the Marvel Cinematic Universe makes Civil War look like a joke fest because it was in many ways. But (laughs) like, yeah, let's not go to Hell's Kitchen. It's an awful place. (laughs) That Luke Cage trailer was good. That uh, that Rocketeer sequel is going to be awesome. I'm so jazzed. Sorry, I'm just I'm, so, I'm like being a little fanboy right now because it's such a great idea. So it really is a great idea to completely change tracks to uh, a much more negative thing. Um, oh. Well, okay, so we ne- most of us never thought we'd see a sequel to the Rocketeer, and we might not still. It's still in development, but the fact that there's a chance is far more than the chance that I ever thought in the history of my working cons, which, again, this week was the 20th anniversary of my having worked conventions. Um, yay! Yay! I'm old. Woo, Trey. Um, in, in all of my years working conventions, I did not expect to see a guest publicly calling out a convention organizer for mismanagement, or wrongdoing. Now, I've seen many guests who will say these things in private, who will say them at convention disaster panels where they make people promise not to repeat anything outside of the panels. I've, you know, I've many guests will voice this stuff, but very few are willing to ever go public with this information or go on the record. Well, 
Holy crap, someone finally has. Power Rangers actor Steve Cardenas posted um, to his uh, official Facebook page um, on uh, back on the uh, August 2nd a post calling out Texas Comic Con organizer uh, Chris Kidd uh, saying that he, uh, the promoter of Texas Comic Con, that he cheated, that he hadn't paid mm-hmm. Steve Cardenas. Somebody's phone buzzed. <laughs> he, Sorry, that was me. That he that that Chris Kidd had not paid him for his appearance, and that checks he had written to other guests had bounced, saying Whoa. that Chris Cardenas owes him uh, thir- uh, thirteen hundred dollars. And uh, yikes. Yeah, Cardenas specifically said his con is one of the worst shows I've ever been to. And at the end of the show, he flat out refused to pay the rest of the money he owes me. Yeah, it's so... Uh, Wow. Wow. Like, I know a lot of you are saying that, like, maybe, you know, it's, yes, the guy didn't get paid. Of course, he's calling him out. But you have to understand that this has happened to other guests and other shows, and it's all radio silence. Like, they will never complain. Um, they will never say anything publicly bad. The fact that that, that that Cardenas is willing to do this shows you exactly how angry that he has to be. Yeah, uh, snap. Uh- <laughs> now... The, for those for, for people at home playing along, the reason why uh, guests normally don't call out publicly organizers is because they're they um, are afraid that they're not going to get invited to more conventions if they're seen you know publicly complaining. But I think mm-hmm. this maybe shows I don't know if this is that we now just live in a more socially media accessible world where people are more you know have easier access like it's more it's easier to complain. And so, you know, you might not stop yourself from doing it. Or if this is just or this is a sign that because the convention scene has exploded and that there are all of these shows that guests can afford to not worry as much about pissing off the bad actors because there are enough good actors who will still invite them. Mm. Yeesh. Yeah, this is... uh... I didn't know what to make of that when I first heard about it, and I still don't know what I make of it. Yeah, I I reached I I emailed uh, Chris Kidd both um, his personal account um, and the official Texas Comic Con uh, account on Facebook. I contacted them and have gotten no response, and they have made no comment. So, yeah, they they they've mm. gone. They as far as I know have not issued any official statement about in or reaction to this fascinating so yeah (laughs) I mean how pay your guests no kidding always do you gotta pay your guests before you pay your hotel I mean pay your hotel but pay your guests first yeah it, it is not a great plan to take off your guests because guests Decent talk to experience. each other. Because here's the thing: is you know, if if you ever talk to guests about um, uh, certain, like I, I can, I think of a handful of convention organizers who I wouldn't want to do business with. This isn't. I'm not singling out any single person here. I can actually think of a half a dozen um, from across the country. Uh, and if mm-hmm. you mention any of these organizers to guests, you you'll you'll hear them talk about crap in private, like. I can specifically mm-hmm. think of of a conversation in an elevator I had during Kitsune Con with one of the guests there about a specific convention organizer. It's it just they they all talk to each other. They all know. They all know. And the fact is now now the tables are turned. Now not now they're not just if if this continues, people like if Steve Cardenas is willing to say this publicly rather than just say this in private to each other, they're willing to tell everybody. I think that's a good thing. I think that I think that is uh, shining a light is is a good thing. 
And, yeah, it um, definitely means uh, that convention runners need to step up their game and make sure they're not letting this crap happen. Yeah, it's and and I have a lot of respect for Steve Hardin for doing this. Um, I know, mm-hmm. I, I know some people might you know, compl- you know, I know so I know certain people in the convention scene who are averse to any sort of drama or talking about drama, and I will never understand those people. Um, like uh, certain, you know, could. You know, I'll admit I'm a bit of a muckraker. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm a muckraker and a troublemaker and a rabble rouser. I I print true Same. things, but, you know, like, I think it's good that people are willing to publicly voice this sort of thing. I think it's a good direction for the community. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, I'll say that maybe, you know, to, to criticize Steve Cardenas a little bit, maybe he should consider um, having someone else write these messages because there's a lot of all caps and uh, hey, hey, unnecessary is cruise control. Multiple for exclamation! You would never end a sentence with multiple exclamation points, people. <laughs> like caps lock is cruise control for awesome. Like I'm 100%. I I believe Steve Cardenas completely, but like when you post like sentences in all caps and use multiple exclamation points, it you automatically have uh, sound like a crazy person in the mental tone on the internet. You know what I mean? Like if there's just random yeah, no, sentences. No, no, that's all... fair. Um, I I recently had a political debate where that was exactly my reaction was. Yeah, and we'll we'll post a link to we'll post a link to this in the show notes, um, so you can read it yourself. But uh, and and again, I'm I'm 100 on Steve Cardenas' side on this issue, but man, he should consider maybe hiring a publicist or an agent, or a publicist agent. Yeah, why not both? Yeah. Uh- well, you know, a lot a lot of these like a lot of these actors don't run their own Facebook pages, but clearly he must do his himself. I, oh, because... I've read I've read actors that run their own pages, and sometimes it's uh, again it's like don't don't do that. Stop. <laughs> like you know, Robert Axelrod doesn't run any of his own social media. Like that doesn't surprise me for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me for some reason. No, it's a lot. A lot of these guests who do a lot of comic conventions don't run a lot of their own social media. Um, they, you know, well, they might craft their own messages, but like the they've got people who they, they have an agent who reads the stuff and makes their official posts for them. Because right. not everyone is good at talking to people directly. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, go go, Steve Cardenas. What what? Yeah, that was pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. You know, speaking of conventions, Nick. Yeah. Hey, speaking of which, um, in just a few short weeks, in that uh, in that weekend, and August uh, twenty. <laughs> this is. I'm so you bad at it. dates. I'm sorry. You got 20, it, Nick. This is the twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. Yes. Yeah, the twenty sixth <laughs> through the twenty eighth. We are going to. All three of us are going to be at. GeekCon in Madison, Wisconsin. Woo-hoo. Um, this is going to involve, of course, the live Nerd and Tie episode at uh, 10 a.m. on Saturday. Saturday, 27th, the 27th of August. Uh, and all, um, and uh, there will be some other panels throughout the weekend. I know there is, uh, Fur will be recording his uh, stand-up album there. I will Friday night at 10 p.m. Nick, you're going to host that, right? I believe so. Yes, and, and yeah. I'm going to be that will be doing me. the actual recording production. Yeah. Trey's going to so, make it sound good. So all three of us will be there for that. Um, are we doing another stand-up show? I'm drawing a blank on that. We are on Saturday okay. night at 9:30. Um, we'll be doing the last edition uh, for the time being of one night stand-up. Uh, along with, uh, yeah, the last episode of Otaku Tonight, we're also doing. And I'm a guest on that. I'm on Saturday. Yeah. yeah Honestly, so like, Trey's going to of... be a part. We're going to be all three together more off, more than we've ever been at a convention. Uh, this we... is pretty exciting, yeah. Also, besides the fact that uh, I'm going to be in the Artist Alley, um, there will be a Nerd and Tie Expo table in the Ambassador Alley. So, you know. 
Well, we'll make first sit there. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you want to uh, discuss Gundam with uh, Archimedes and me, we're going to be doing that uh, Saturday afternoon. Yeah, so it's, it's August 26th through 28th at the Madison Marriott West. Oh. Excuse um, me, with uh, Archimedes, Reyna, and me. Ooh. Mess that one up. Yeah. More Gundam throwdowns. Not really throwdowns. Mostly just talking about fun stuff. Yeah, so, so it's going to be at the Madison Marriott West in Middleton, Wisconsin. Because <laughs> it's 10 feet outside of Madison. I still say Madison because saying you're recording your debut album in Madison sounds better than I'm recording my debut album in Middleton. Just just say I you're recording forgot. your debut album at the Madison Marriott West. I almost forgot. There's also uh, I was I was just reminded that there was also uh, going to be a uh, mock cross panel with uh, um, paper cosplay Rana and myself. I don't believe you. Ah. Uh, but you must. There will be robots and singing and singing robots if we talk about plus. Now, those of you at home may be asking yourselves, hey, that wasn't a lot of news stories, and there see- sure seems to be a lot of episode left on the timer after this. <laughs> right, we've only been talking for like 30 minutes, so guess what we got, guys? The the world's biggest mailbag right now, and we gotta get to it. All right, big fat mailbag. It's a big fat mailbag, and I'm here to lighten its load. Anyways, launching straight into the mailbag, which has got a lot of stuff in here. I've got the first letter here from uh, Corfan. Corfan wrote in about the Vomit Hat Steve Challenge with a not real guest of The Naming of Saiyan Attacks by Toriyama Akira. <laughs> that is that is not the book we're doing right now. It's adorable that you it's a cute guess. It's funny. I'll give you that. I can't I hate that the dub says Saiyan. It's not even the right pronunciation. It says make us over there. That's that's what every American says, and it's wrong. Sure sounds like the American pronunciation to me. It's like that in the dub. Yes, that's what I'm saying, but it's wrong. That's the official English pronunciation. Yeah, and the official English pronunciation is wrong, just like a lot of things they say in the official English pronunciation of Dragon Ball is wrong. What's the proper pronunciation, Nick? Uh, Cyan. In the Japanese, it's Saiyajin. So Cyan would be the more sign, per- correct. And it opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. Just like it's anyway, not Krillin, it's Kuriren. It's not... It's not Tien, it's Tenshinhan. His blonde hair anyway, started Vomit Hat. Show. Uh, anyway, anyway sorry, sorry, Corfan, you didn't get the... Yeah, that's not right. Moving on. You're wrong. We have our... <laughs> first Sorry. of a trilogy of males from Langland <laughs> this week. <laughs> so, so much Langland I'm gonna, letter. I'm going to wow. get the first one, and then Nick is going to take the Empire Strikes Back, and then Trey is going to take the turn <laughs> of the Langland. Uh, I, have, so I have the search for Langland. Thank you very much. The new Ghostbusters movie and some extra stuff. Hey guys, so as you already can guess from the subject, yes, I watched the all-female Ghostbusters movie. Overall, it was pretty good. However, the first movie from the 1980s will always be the best. No offense, if you actually take any. I liked the all cool new weapons they introduced, and the cast was very funny. The cameos from the original cast were awesome. With that said, I liked Chris Hemsworth's character, Kevin, but I wasn't a fan of making him an idiot. I honestly feel like making male characters intellectually challenged in movies, cartoons, and commercials has gotten way too old at this point, but that's my opinion. Okay, a little side note. Um, uh, that The longest time in comedy, it was always the women that were the dumb ones. And I'm uh-huh. blanking on the comedian that changed it up, but it was him and his wife. They were a comedy team. They changed it around and made and, and it's a relatively new feature in comedy. Uh, also, like also, less, also less Chris Hemsworth is years. hilarious, and to be fair, no other male character in that film is portrayed as stupid, no, it's, including anyways. the antagonist. 
There's just one guys, dumb guy. Well, you guys likely disagree with me because, well, I know where your opinions likely stand on the topic. I kind of hope in the future sequels that the characters get utilized more positively in the sequels, even though his role is very well executed in the movie. I kind of hoped there would be sequels too, but it's not sounding likely. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, there might be an Which animated series based on this version of the Ghostbusters, but uh, it, while it's made back its budget, it, I don't think it did well enough to justify a sequel. That's what they're saying now, but there's still three markets. It hasn't opened in France, Mexico, or... Yeah, it's unfortunately didn't get a Chinese release, and I think that's really... Um, that hurt it. That hurt, yeah. that hurt the yeah. film a lot. Um, that's probably going to hurt Suicide Squad too, since it's looking like they're not going to get a Chinese release. Yeah. Anyways, uh, overall it was very good as I enjoyed the nods to old movies. Uh, so I think the movie, in a way, is its own gem, even though the public might have different thoughts on it. With that said, I would like to warn you not to read the last. Po- okay, just pretend like I'm asking you who would win in a fight. Uh, whatever, I'll just whatever. I don't even care. Uh, I have one PS. I have one question. Which one of you three has best dating advice? Because I might need some in the future. I apparently have a girlfriend, and I can't seem to process this right now. That's all. Have a good one, guys. Langland. Um, Nick and Nick and Trey are both married, and I'm not great to ask for dating advice. <laughs> so, uh, don't ask me. Uh, uh, Nick or Trey, do either of you have dating advice? Never, even though you've been out of the game for a while. Never punch your significant other's mother. Uh, start if they're gonna start Macross. I recommend either the original <laughs> movie, Do You Remember Love, or skipping to Frontier because Frontier kind of is a nice like getting your feet wet in the in the series, and it's don't it's, assume it's your needs are her needs. Mm-hmm. Listen, understand. Sometimes people want to complain about things not because they want you to fix it, but just because they want someone to hear them. And so you don't always have to offer advice on how to fix a problem. Sometimes you just need to listen to their problem so they can feel like they've been heard and feel like they're less alone in the world and that someone understands them. Yes. All right. Woohoo! So let's continue on to the next Langland letter. The Langland strikes back. Um, subject: Star Trek Beyond. Star Trek and across the universe on, on the, the Starship Enterprise, Enterprise under Captain Kirk. Kirk. Star Trek and across the universe, only, only going, going forward because we, we can't, can't find, find reverse. reverse. Yeah, I haven't heard that song in years. All right, now I got that I've got your eyes rolling now, let's get down to business. I didn't realize just how close this movie was going to be released from Ghostbusters, so I would have warned you ahead of time and saved my stupidity for this letter. So I checked out the movie as well, and I actually really, really liked it. Good acting, writing, lots of action, lots of suspense. It's a good old-fashioned Star Trek uh even though I have only watched a few episodes from the old series. There was never a dull or slow moment in the movie. I was entertained by the movie, and I'm excited for the fourth film. Personally, there is a set of villains I want to see enter this newly named uh, timeline, uh, but you hardcore Trekkies will likely disagree with me, so I won't say it because I don't want to invoke your nerd wrath. We don't need a Wrath of Trey, honestly. I, you know, I don't know who he's talking about, so I can't have an I opinion. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, the, the Zindi. I actually don't <laughs> hate the Zindi. Like, I don't hate the Zindi either. I just well, pulled a really random Star Trek race question mark. Out of I don't know. Book? I've been I've been seeing that they're talking about bringing the Borg in for the fourth movie. Okay, it's a new timeline, I'm, so anything. I would can say I'm not in love with that concept, but I'm not opposed to it either. Yeah, it, <laughs> you can alter. You know, it's it's not in the same universe, so you can move like that contact with them up earlier. Anyways, you just finish reading the letter, and then we can talk about Star Trek. Um, 
So that said, it's a good movie. I know movie technology has changed much from the good old days of Star Trek from the 60s, and it definitely shows. And needless to say, I, I've i loved seeing how the futuristic technology looks in these movies. Overall, I really loved the movie, and once again, I hope we see more sequels because I want to see Kirk take on more adventures and more enemies, especially one set once, uh, uh, once again I won't name... Uh, because I don't want you guys to be calling me names for not being a true Trekkie, because I'm not a hardcore Trekkie. Th- uh, always identified that's more I as got. a Trekker. But, uh... he, keep on Spocking in the free world. That's my catchphrase. Anyway. All right, so Star um, Trek Beyond, you've seen it, right, Nick? Yeah, it's probably my favorite movie I've seen this year. I, it's fan- it's fantastic. Um, I don't like the fact that they they blew up the Enterprise again. Which is not a spoiler because it's in the trailer. <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually liked that because it was drawn out. It like it wasn't like in so many of these movies when they do that, it's a very instant thing. This was drawn out, and yeah. it felt like watching a friend die, but, which should be the effect of watching yeah. the Enterprise yeah. blow up because it's a crew member. But you know, blowing up sort of blowing way. up the Enterprise in the third movie is just. I know, anyway. but, I, <laughs> but I, I honestly think they did it better in this movie than they did in Star Trek Three, by a lot. Yeah. Okay. So, so going back to the Star Trek Beyond, I I was a little annoyed they blew up the Enterprise, but I, that I can get over because the rest of this movie I really loved. Um, it it's the, really the first time in the the new Kelvin timeline that I felt like it really felt like Star Trek. Um, don't get me wrong, it was I love a big I, budget episode of the original show. I love it Star really Trek Two Thousand Nine. I think Star Trek 2009 is a great origin story for this new version of Kirk. Um, Into Darkness, we all genuinely agree, is uh, something that shouldn't have happened. Um, Mm -hmm. But we'll just move. It's that movie that we go, yep, that happened. Moving forward. Um, (laughs) And and this movie ignores it completely, which is convenient, because I also like ignoring it. Well, you know, it's it's not that, yeah, it, it doesn't erase it, but it doesn't touch back to it. Well, it does touch back to the first movie, and I think that it really shows that with Simon Pegg co-writing this film, that it shows what happens when someone with a, a true understanding of Star Trek uh, takes the helm, and I'm, I'm so I'm so in love with the script. I love the fact that you don't need to know anything about Star Trek continuity to, to enjoy this movie, but if you do know you you understand that the the Franklin, they must have redone its uh, registry number after the Federation was formed. That's the only explanation for That's why. That's the only way it makes sense. Because it just... it's the first warp four vessel. It was just built. But we know when uh, it was built, like within five years before the first five years before the Enterprise. Uh, it is. Uh, it was a Mako vessel, and mm-hmm. it, it must have gotten its new registry. And when the Makos were dissolved. Um, rolled into the 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 Starfleet, um, the Federation Starfleet after the Makos were dissolved. That's the formation of the Federation. But it, there was two hundred percent more Enterprise references in this movie than I expect. Oh my God! Yeah. Well, what I love about that first off, what I love is that it wasn't actually meant to look so much like the uh, the NX01. Um, it, <laughs> it 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 was actually like originally the nacelles were supposed to be underneath it, but to do the the falling off the cliff shot like for that whole sequence to make sense the themselves had to be above it so like literally the ship got accidentally redesigned to look like at the right point in the lineage of federation starships that's hilarious and great oh it's it's so great um but i love i love the franklin um i love the the references to the romulan and zindi wars mhm same yeah it's Oh, I I just I love I love this the movie. costume designs. Can we just sidestep like the redesign of the basic duty uniforms just looks so much better than uh, the two thousand nine Into Darkness ones. The uh, away team jackets were great. I absolutely love those. Yeah. Ugh. No, it's oh, a... and a villain, a compelling villain, a villain oh whose God. motivations are make sense and explained within the film. The, the... That was so great. Oh, and Jayla. Jayla was great. Yeah. And that thing about and the uh, the uh, homage to Leonard Nimoy at the very end made me cry human tears. Yeah. Like, oh. oh, and I love I love the banter between uh, Spock and McCoy in this. 
Uh, that was the that easily. This has been uh, um, the this has been McCoy's best movie. Yeah, well, it's he actually so Car- good. The, they had to, or else Carl Urban wasn't going to come back. Mm-hmm. Carl Urban wasn't required, wasn't contractually required to come back for a third film like some of the other co-stars, and so he was considering leaving McCoy if he didn't like if it wasn't a better part. And uh, they they made sure that he wanted to come back, and I, I I really appreciate it because one of the best things about the um the original series is of course the banter between DeForest Kelly and um, Leonard Nimoy's uh, McCoy and Spock, and so seeing that with Zach Quinto and uh, Carl Urban in the new um in, in it was the, perfect it, it was great it was great and that it was amazing I really loved that I I cannot sing the praises of Star Trek Beyond enough. Like I'm, I am a huge fan of this movie. It is by far, um, and as long as you consider Galaxy Quest part of the timeline, part of the even odd theory, it com- mm-hmm. can maintains the even odd theory. So, you know, I'm I'm happy. I'm a happy man watching this movie. I really really enjoyed this. Yeah, no, same. I'm really happy with does it. That mean that, I, does that mean that Simon Pegg is going to, like, intentionally, like, co-write the fourth one as being really bad? <laughs> so that, that I hope not. To so be fair, like, to, be, right. to be fair, sir, not every not every odd-numbered one is terrible. Like, yeah, three is actually pretty watchable. Yeah, Search for Spock is not bad. I actually like the motion picture. It's just um, too much uh, special effects porn. Yeah, and it, once you know the twist in the story, it doesn't hold under repeated viewing. Yeah, you know well. what it is? It's an hour of plot in a two-hour movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, but but I still enjoy the film, and they got to recycle all of that Enterprise exterior in, like, two other films, because um, all the exterior shots in Wrath of Khan are from Star Trek The Motion Picture. I was say, yeah, because uh, Wrath of Khan had a drastically slashed budget so yeah and they recycled all of those fly around shots of the enterprise and space dock it's it's literally the same like it's the the footage from the previous movie Mm -hmm. Uh, oh yeah i knew that anyways let's move on because you know we we've got more to go we got (laughs) about three more letters to get to all right so i'm taking the third langland movie the langland movie the third langland letter Paul Langland writes us, subject, Suicide Squad. Yep, guys, this is my third message for you to read. I think I just said that. So I checked out Suicide Squad because the movie got heavily hyped for a while, and I sort of was hoping it would be good. Well, I feel the movie was a terrible attempt by Warner Brothers to make a knockoff of the Avengers, but only with bad guys, while, of course, they are also trying to build up for the Justice League, too. I hope that wasn't too much of a spoiler. It, it's not. It, we write about that all the time, so anyone listening to this knows that. All right. Honestly, the action was pretty good. I have mixed feelings on the Joker, though. I applaud the costuming for the character, as it was a fairly accurate for the character. However, I'm not a fan of his grills, those silver teeth, if you aren't familiar with them. Langland explained that. I assumed everybody knew what grills were, because I'm hip and with it. <laughs> Overall, the movie feels like another sad attempt by WB to launch their own cinematic universe to rival Marvel, and they're doing a crappy job at it. It still makes me sad because I really want to see DC make a decent cinematic universe. If you guys still haven't seen it, I'd say just wait till Voodoo or Amazon Prime will allow the rental to see it. So yeah, that's all I have to say about this movie. I hope the next DC films are better or else the cinematic universe is going to bomb. Peace out, guys. So, I'm, am I the only one here who's seen Suicide Squad? Yeah. Okay, so my thoughts on Suicide Squad. It is way better than Batman vs. Superman <laughs> in the sense that I was not bored while watching the movie. And there are a couple of tiny highlights in the film, I want to say. There's a brief cameo because um, they, they show how uh, Captain Boomerang got captured by The Flash. And so there's a brief, tiny little cameo of, of Ezra Miller as uh, The Flash that I actually really liked. Like, well, so, that's good. I mean, it's like literally less than 30 seconds long, but that's an amazing little scene. So I'm really, that got me hyped up about The Flash. Um, overall, I'll say this movie was uh, a movie 
which I can't say about Batman versus Superman. So let's just all like applaud them for putting out a film that was watchable. Um, it's not great. Uh, but Will Smith is actually Will Smith's performance is very good because he's Will Smith and he could probably I mean, frankly, Will Smith is good in Wild Wild West, even though that movie is terrible. Um, and Will, you know, Will Smith is actually trying this time around. So, you know, got to respect. And so, yeah, Will Smith was excellent in this film. Um, I like, you know, it's, I like a lot of the actors in this film. I think a lot I even stupid Jared Leto, I think, did an okay job at playing a version of the character that I hate. Um, I've uh, I've actually heard nothing good about his performance. Well, okay, like, so his on-screen performance, but I love the fact that Will Smith personally hates Jared Leto. <laughs> like, he's literally come out and said, I hate Jared Leto, and then, like, his publicists have tried to spin it, but he keeps, like, repeating that he hates Jared Leto as a person. Um... Just to be fair, Jared Leto's kind of a kind of trash. Yeah. How are we supposed to believe that old guy Batman? Yeah, you know, not super old, but old, decent. You know, getting up there in age, Batman. Like this is his rival. Well, like Jared not, like, Leto's in his thirties. I know, but there's no way they have a long-standing rivalry at this point. Oh no, that like, makes perfect sense maybe to a me. A couple of years, but. If the Joker uh, rose to prominence while he was in his 20s and Batman rose to prominence while he was in his 30s, which is usually when Batman becomes Batman. I'm not feeling it. I'm, I'm I, not. I, 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 I hate, totally I feel hate it. everything about his aesthetic. I, I, again, I haven't seen the movie. I uh, just... I, I think it works up in the context of the film. Uh, I what I hate about it is the the way the the Joker Harley romance is not portrayed as the dark abusive thing that it is. Yeah, the don't comics. they play it as like actually romantic? Yeah, they do. Because which... so, that's disgusting. Which it makes sense. But apparently, sense... there was supposed to be a lot in like the deleted scenes that explain. I that. don't that's... care about the well, deleted scenes. Well, okay, so scenes. so I will say my only justification for it is that if you look at the way the the chosen flashbacks as the way Harley remembers it, like as the parts that Harley's choosing to remember. Okay. Because this is at the point in her story, like we're not talking like a, we're not talking like, okay, so normally when Harley Quinn is a participant in the Suicide Squad, it's when she's post-Joker, you know, more of the beginning of her anti-hero part of her arc. The version of Harley Quinn in this is more along the lines of early Harley Quinn when she was still, you know, like, working with the Joker. I get that, but here's the thing. Like, there is a dangerous, dangerous amount of people who romanticize that abusive, terrible relationship. I don't disagree. And just gloss over it. I don't disagree. And what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that what I'm saying is, is that I believe that while I don't like the way it's portrayed in this movie, they have a chance to course correct. I, I know they have a chance to course correct, but I, you, you know me, I don't, I, I will, I rate movies for what they do, not based on what their sequels might do. Well, and I like, think, I, I think I, I had that talk with Man of Steel so many years ago where people were like, oh, but they're setting up. Maybe they'll have the hit. And, Superman doesn't kill people as a plot point in the future. It's like, I don't care about the future. No, I, I care I, about this. Movie. I agree with you completely. I just think there are bigger problems with this film. <laughs> And and the bigger problem uh, is yeah. that it, this flows like uh, this. Uh, this is the flow in this film is awful. It's really clear that there was a lot of studio interference at the edit of this movie because you're never quite like while it manages to maintain enough momentum to like not get boring. It's really like unclear. Like the story structure is so unclear that it makes you really like y- you you feel like you're in. An hour into the film, you feel like you where you should have been at fifteen minutes into the film, and like, yeah, that I I, I've so heard the horror janky. stories about that they've had to like edit, or like that they brought in a different editor to do a different cut of the movie. Yeah, like it's, this this but whole version of the from film, the director. Yeah, and then when that tested better than the director's version, that's when they went and did reshoots to make to fill out the uh, the studio edit. It's the entire film just feels janky. And it's it's really hard to follow. And while it's true that maybe, you know, it, it's good to abandon the Hollywood formula sometimes, if you're going to abandon the Hollywood formula, it takes a lot more work and you have to do it well. Star Trek VI abandons the Hollywood formula completely. 
rearranging when you have slow parts with action and all this stuff, but it does it perfectly. Nicholas Meyer w- did a masterpiece of Star Trek VI, but you have to be that good to get away with abandoning that standard um, that standard act structure of a Hollywood blockbuster. And there's a reason why people like that act structure, because it's the natural way that we've been trained to follow a story. And if you don't go anywhere in that ballpark, you've got to be an amazing storyteller to do it. And guess what? This film was not made by amazing storytellers. I, I hate saying this, but there's, there's a movement online where the their their thesis is we need to support DC movies so that we can still get more DC movies. I don't think that's true. <clears throat> and, I we're gonna and, get no, Wonder I, Woman and Justice League no matter what. Mm-hmm. Th- and that's kind of where I'm at. Is that I I do not feel that we should support if I don't feel that D- if DC if Warner Brothers is going to make crappy movies based on DC. I would rather them not make any movies at all. Exactly. That's my honest take. Exactly. On it. I'd rather like give if... it 10 years than that's why like my hopes are like now justice league. They've, they've literally talked about how they're the, the filmmakers are specifically looking at feedback from justice league and um, Batman versus Superman and, and changing the film. Um, my own, you know, it's so, but you can kind of tell they did that with Batman v Superman too. So that's kind of, I'm, well, I'm not like, like the entire plot point about, Oh, Batman's upset Superman destroyed the city. I don't believe for a second that they were planning that from the beginning. No, that they weren't. I don't weren't, believe that but for that, a second. That's a very different situation. That is a situation where Scott Snyder was like, so Batman versus Superman, Zack Snyder, Zack Snyder. God, Scott Snyder? I think I went to high school with that guy. Um, <laughs> uh, so Zack Snyder was given free reign with Batman versus Superman. Um, he was given full control. And so that's him responding to the fans, not um, a studio mm-hmm. responding. So it's it's a different situation. The whole the Man of Steel was very financially successful, so the studio just let him do whatever the heck he wanted with Batman versus Superman. Now there are other people, including the DC creative people, who are sticking their nose in. And so that's why I have that's why I think it's very different to look at how they're listening with Justice League versus how they, quote-unquote, Zack Snyder reacted to fans in a dickish manner. I, I just, I'm worried, I, I would really like to see Zack Snyder have his hand less in any of these pots. Well, and I think like, that's, I, that's I can't imagine, what's happened. I can't imagine why Warner Brothers are, is letting him direct Justice League. I can't, I, I can't Contract. wrap my head around the fact that he was the story consultant on Wonder Woman. That's horrifying to me. Well, I wonder how much, you know, people get consultant titles all the time just based on money. And I, so, I, I hope that that's all it is because he should not be allowed anywhere near a feminist icon. Yeah, it's, I think... I, the, the fact that he is being allowed to direct two movies with Wonder Woman in it is a freaking atrocity in and of itself. Yeah, so... I, but that's why it's so... I'm not going to... you know I Don't support DC movies because they're DC movies. Support movies if you like them, if they're good. And that's why, like, if you want to skip Suicide Squad, go ahead. It's it's honestly like, you know, if it's at the dollar theater down the block, if you have one in your town, go see it. If it's at the $3 theater, maybe wonder if you've got better options. <laughs> um, Anyways... Anyways, for why don't you take a, a, li- a letter not by Langland? Yeah, we got one from Archimise here. Uh, Archimise writes, Hey, tie wearing. Oh, the subject is fan fiction brought to life. Hey, tie wearing nerds. So I just finished watching Terminator Genesis, and boy, howdy, what a movie. To be clear, I grew up watching the first two movies with my brothers, so they hold a special place in my heart, while still being quite excellent movies. The third and fourth movie did leave something to be desired, but this one, a new one, is quite the treat. I won't spoil it beyond the trailer. But the basic premise is that we follow Kyle Reese back to the first movie, only to be ambushed by a, two, by a T-1000 liquid metal dude. When did this movie dude. come out? Like, was it last year? I, I think it was last year, yeah. I saw it at the drive-in, and I'm pretty sure <laughs> it, was it wasn't last this year. year. It was... And is rescued fully by a soldiered-up Sarah Connor, who has saved his young girl by the T-800 himself, Arnold. Already a pretty awesome premise. What follows is a combination of shot-for-shot scenes from the original two movies and a fantastic adventure through time and bullets. 
It seriously feels like a fanfic brought to glorious life with lots of love and creativity. I mean, it's got Matt Smith in a movie about time-traveling robot. Who does that? I have to say, I really enjoyed this movie. I wouldn't necessarily call it good, but it certainly was fun. I actually stopped caring about whether they stopped Skynet in the end as much as I wanted to see what was going to happen next to our plucky heroes. I really like Genesis. I really like the Terminator series of movies. I think they're actually quite good and entertaining. Um, I agree that like the first and two were amazing. I I didn't like the third one so much, but I actually really enjoyed Terminator Term- Salvation. Terminator th- like, 3 is awful. Terminator yeah, 3 is just awful. I didn't see Salvation because I was so disappointed with Terminator 3. It's, Salvation's really good. Like it's a really good fun movie. Like I It's, it's pretty good. Yeah, I enjoyed it. But but it's I like Christian Genesis Bale and, I, and uh, Anton Yelchin beating up robots. It's good. Yeah, yeah, I I will say that like I I know last year when when Genesis actually came out I talked about it on the show and I liked it. It it's not the best movie. It's um, an entertaining movie. It's what it's it's a fun movie that doesn't try to be it, anything other it's than It's got fun. the second best Sarah Connor from Game of Thrones. And <laughs> that's right. Because I actually really loved the Sarah Connor Chronicles, that show. Um, but uh, like, you know, I, it's it, it's OK. It Again, it like that's the movie where I found out while watching it that Jai Courtney and Michael Rosenbaum are two different actors. <laughs> um of course, all this all leads to my question for the evening. What fan fictions would you like to see made into a movie major motion picture? And what movies are pretty much fan fics in a major motion picture format? Um, I would say already done. I would say pretty much the entire Pirates of the Caribbean series is a fan fiction. <laughs> that, that is an incredible franchise because they have made a huge franchise of movies off of only one good movie. Right, and everything is fan fiction. They Honestly, made they made a successful like a series fiction. of movies off of an amusement park ride. Mm-hmm. So they made one good movie and three steaming piles off of an amusement park ride. Let's Soon let's be, be honest here. Soon to be four. Jesus. Yeah. Well, you know, so um, here's here's the thing. My favorite fan fiction already did sort of get turned into a motion picture. If you add together all the web series episodes of My Immortal. Exactly. Um, the My Immortal web see. series based off the phenomenal fanfic My Immortal. Also, <laughs> seemingly what Harry Potter and the Cursed Child is based off of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say, too, like, uh, like it, I know it's not, but Pacific Rim really had some really strong fanfiction elements to it, honestly. It was like, a lot like my Voltron fanfic. It was really, it, it was good, though, like a good kind of, anyway. Um, actually, um, I, I know what my favorite fanfic that got turned into a movie was. What's that? Captain America Winter Soldier. There you go. Because uh, Ed Brubaker spent pretty much his entire teenage years trying to figure out how to bring Bucky Barnes back from the dead before working at Marvel. So it counts. <laughs> That's all for this evening. If you liked, If you like Miss Michael... If you like or missed Michael Bean in Genesis, I know I did, and want to see what he's been up to, go check out Archimize Arcade on YouTube and watch his Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon Let's Play. It's pretty great, I guess. Also, hi, Shameless. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Terminator Genesis yet? You should. It's almost as good as Streets of Fire and Blue Thunder. Jesus Christ. Signed Archimize. How many Streets of Thunder throwbacks are we going to get on this show? All right, last one. We can do this. One more letter. Woohoo! Let's let's do this. We got long t- uh, We got one that we haven't heard from in a long time. It's Brenda Gibner. Brenda. Uh, subject is. Hey, Brenda. Subject is moving. Hello, Trey, Nick, and Fur. Hello, Brenda. So I've been. Hey, Brenda. So I've been busy uh, and just recently started listening to the podcast again. I really do not remember the last time I listened to it, and I am very sad I missed a lot. I, I believe it. I told you all I have. Uh, 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 I had a, uh, my son Ezra, named after Ezra from Star Wars Rebels, on February 7th, and he is now home after 45 days in the NICU. Oh. Uh, he went to Phoenix uh, Comic Con uh, in June and met David Ramsey. We are moving out of the desert in October and moving to Ohio. 
so hopefully I can catch a con you will be at. I hope you guys uh, have talked about this, but has anyone read uh, the... Uh, but has anyone read the setup wizard? It definitely keeps me entertained and helped uh, me through a hard time. I have not read that. I'm sorry. I'll take a look. I've also started watching Supernatural and love it. (laughs) I hope the heat wave is not too bad for you guys, and I hope uh, you have a good next two weeks. P.S. Go Team Mystic. Boo! Rabble, 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 rabble. Rabble, rabble, rabble. Valor. Go Team Valor. Uh, Go team Supernatural. So, so I wonder where Brenda is in Supernatural, because yeah. because the, 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 we're going on to season twelve now, I think, in the fall. So, like, there's so many different eras on that show. For the for... show is as old as its target demographic. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear God! Oh, and they're gonna keep going as long as the actors are willing. At this point. That show premiered on the WB, not the CW, the WB. That show was yeah, um, premiered while like Arrested Development was just on the air. Like, think about that. Yeah. Wow. Veronica Mars was a contemporary on the network on the CW. Oh dear God. Okay. Wow. Um. A long oh time ago, we used to be friends haven't thought of you lately at all come on now sugar bring it on well with that i think we we are we actually emptied out the mailbag which took a lot of work it's good to hear from you brenda Mm -hmm. we we like checking in brenda also great star wars character to name your kid after i like ezra i'm I, i i prefer to be better than ezra Nineties music reference that ha- most of our audience won't get. Hey, Ezra versus Thrawn coming soon. All right, so well, let's hope Thrawn is better than Ezra. No, um, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep making jokes, you know, as long as Star Wars Rebels is only. All right, so, all right, now we move on to the last part of the show, and that is the Vomit Hat Steve Challenge. The vomit. Jelly. The Vomit Hat Steve Challenge is the part of the show where I read a line from a book, and the challenge to you, the listener, is to guess what book I am reading from. If you guess correctly, you get included in our Hall of Awesome. The benefits of the Hall of Awesome are as follows. One, you get your name read aloud every episode. Two, we get your name listed on our website. And three, I might give you a high five every once in a while if I see you in person. Whoa, we added something new to the Hall of Awesome. Yeah. For after three years, we added something new. That's cool. No, I was always willing to do that. I just didn't say it. All right. So the following people are currently in the Hall of Awesome: Archimedes, Zero, Ren, and Senti, Cheesy McDamu, Krista, Slytherin, Shameless Attack with the Random Ramblings, Van Corfran, Capito, Chris Graham, Melisaurus, Caper Godzilla, Kevzy, and the Minnesota Librarians. Now, I've been reading from this book for a while, and so far, no one's guessed it. So I'm going to pick a random sentence. And the sentence is of the current book is as follows. Thurston pointed out that if the king and the people agreed to change the constitution, then that would not constitute a revolution. If you know what book that's uh, from, go to nerdandtie.com slash contact. Practically giving uh, it away at this point. I know. Go to nerdandtie.com, click on the contact form, and tell us. Um, or if you have anything else you want to tell us about yourself, if you want to be have your redder, letter, your redder, your letter read aloud in an episode, I'll go there too. Redder, though. Tell us, you know, how much you like the show better when you can't see what we're doing. Tell us why Ferg should never have to wear pants again. Tell us why Trey should always have to wear pants again. Just also go great. nerdandtie.com slash contact, click on the form, be a person, do the thing Split. that you are supposed to do with <clears> the <throat> thing of the other stuff. <laughs> and while you're at it, subscribe to us and like us on the iTunes, on the Stitcher, on the Google Play Store. Do all that. Let us know what you think of the show and uh, let others know as well. We should escape into the ether now. We should. With Indeed. that, as always, thank you so much for joining us. 
for another fortnight of the most nerdy news you can handle in an hour and a half. As always, I'm Professor Firsters. I'm Trey Dorn. And I'm Nick Izumi. We'll see you all in a couple weeks, and we'll see you at GeekCon. Have a great fortnight. And, and you know, you can't see the dance party this episode, but know that we're dancing in your mind. Keep on sparking in the free world. Pre-register for the Nerd and Tie Expo at expo.nerdandtie.com. Buy my CD and Trey's CDs and Nick's. Never punch a baby. I don't. I don't have merch yet. Invest everything you have right. in Steve Howard weaving machines. You should That's contribute right. to Nick Azumi's Patreon at patreon.com/slash Nick Azumi. Please do that. It helps. And as always, sell me a phone. I hate you so much.